uh, one of the main roles of corporate courts is to review decisions made by corporate organs, usually the board of directors, both ex ante, when a plaintiff seeks an injunction against a future decision that has not yet been made, and ex post, when a plaintiff claims a certain decision that was already made and executed is unreasonable and negligent and caused him damages. And I'd like to talk to, today about the met methods applied by the courts in reviewing corporate decisions. So we are all familiar, at least now, with the business judgment rule and the entire fairness doctrine and the new ruling of the MFW uh, um, decision in the Delaware Supreme Court. But before discussing them, I would like to try to make a certain distinction between two different kinds of methods, the substantive review and the procedural review. Substantive review is normally used in reviewing conflicted decisions. The court reviews the decision itself, the merits of the decision, and considers the question whether, to the judge's opinion, this was the right decision the board had to make, according to all of the relevant circumstances known to the board at the time. If, for example, the board decided to purchase an asset on behalf of the company, the court may check whether the price the company agreed to pay was the right price, whether investing in this specific area was the right decision at the time, etc. Under Israeli law, the court has the authority to review a decision on its merits in the case of appraisal claims, and courts in appraisal claims have to decide whether the fair value of the purchased shares, what the fair value of the purchased shares should be. Supposedly, the idea that the court, to let the court review the decisions made on behalf of the company may seem like a very good idea. A disinterested, objective third party makes all the right decisions on behalf of the company when necessary. The court, being both professional and totally disinterested, should theoretically be able to reach all the best decisions on behalf of the company, rather than the decisions made by the usually conflicted majority or even by the so-called disinterested minority. All of the shareholders could be sure someone is protecting them, someone whose only worry is to benefit the company. But of course, despite what I just said, uh, there are naturally some clear disadvantages to this method. First of all, the assumption that the court, even an expert professional court, can make all the right decisions on behalf of the company is at least a very doubtful assumption. Business decisions are best made by business people, preferably the ones that are the real parties to the deal and not by the party that would not have to bear the consequences of the decision. Another disadvantage is the fact that the party to the transaction, for example, the majority shareholder that purchased the minority's share, cannot be sure that the terms he or she agreed upon will be confirmed by the court. And a court decision forcing the majority to increase the agreed price is naturally very problematic. Apart from that, if the minority shareholders know that they can claim that the price they agreed upon for their shares is not the fair price, their motivation to agree only when the price is fair from their point of view is not strong, which will make it difficult to rely on their agreement later uh, if the court is looking for uh, uh, something to rely upon. Procedural review, on the other hand, is normally used in reviewing non-conflicted decision. When using this method, the court does not review the substance of the decision, but only checks whether the board applied the full necessary procedure before it reached its, its, it reached its decision. When applying a procedural review, the court is not a player in the decision-making field, but rather a policeman, making sure the players are playing by the rules. After the rules have been set, the role of the court is then more technical to make sure the decision makers did what they had to do before making the decision. And if so, the decision is supposedly immune from court intervention. According to the procedural, procedural approach, the court's only task is to make sure that the preconditions for making the decision have been met. If this is the case, the deal will be approved regardless, regardless of its terms and conditions. Supporters of this approach would be more skeptical of the court's ability to make better business decisions than the relevant organs of the company. Besides the question re regarding the ability of the court to make good business decisions on behalf of the company, and the question regarding the ability to scientifically estimate the right price of the deal, especially when we're talking about appraising the value of a company which involves predictions about a lot of unknown future variables, the so-called procedural method 
has other advantages as well. If courts have less power to intervene with a company's decision, it certainly has an effect on the number of times plaintiffs would seek such, such intervention, and it might decrease the potential for meritless suits overburdening the court. Apart from that, if the court is only authorized to check the decision-making process, it would enable the decision-makers to feel more secure that as long as they follow the relevant procedure, the court would not intervene with the terms of the deal, an intervention that is contrary to their expectations. Furthermore, the procedure in which the court checks the substance of the decision, either by itself or with the help of, of an expert, is a very expensive one, since a third party, which is an outsider to the deal, has to learn all the relevant information about the deal, about the company, about the relevant market. Courts usually declare that they wish to refrain from in intervening in business decisions made by business people and that they prefer to only supervise the procedure. The business judgment rule is an example of a rule that, when applied, directs the court to refrain from intervention. When the board is making an informed decision in good faith and there is no conflict of interest, the court will not intervene with the decision of the board. I should add that the business judgment rule was applied several times by courts in Israel, although its exact scope has not yet been decided. So, where there is a conflict of interest, the role of the court in reviewing the decision is different, normally entailing a substantive review. However, there still can be procedural conditions that may immune the decision from intervention by the court. The court in Israel tried to direct future boards to, to a procedure that, if followed, would enable the court to refrain from checking the merits of the decision and intervening with it in cases there is a conflict and the business judgment rule does not apply. Such was the case in the Israeli court's decision of Mahdeshi Magan of Kim China, where there was a merger between a parent and a subsidiary. The court advised future parties of a procedure that, if followed, would minimize the risk of court's intervention. The procedure men mentioned by Judge Keret Meir that gave that decision included negotiating, negotiating the terms of the deal in a way that would replicate a real arm's length negotiation by both setting an independent committee and having the final terms approved by the majority of the minority shareholder. Um, which is a legal precondition in Israel. In the MFW case that dealt with an acquisition of the minority by the majority, the Delaware Supreme Court described the facts as follows. Th from the outset, M&F's proposal to take MFW par private <clears throat> was made contingent upon two stockholder protective procedural conditions. First, M&F required the merger to be negotiated and approved by a special committee of independent MFW directors. And second, M&F required that the merger be approved by a majority of the stockholders unaffiliated with M&F. So in the short, times, sh short time I have, I would like to make two comments about these methods of review and of some dilemmas that they present. First, I'd like to talk about the difficulty to refrain from intervention without checking the merits of the decision. I think that at least as much as Israeli judges are concerned, or at least as, as far as I am concerned, it is not easy to give up the ability to review the substance of the corporate decision in question and to only check the procedural aspects of the decision, the, of the decision-making process. I believe that being able to give up the control over checking the substance of the decision may require some self-educating about the value of restraint if we truly wish to imply the procedural rules. Suppose the court decides that the relevant decision being attacked is subject to the business judgment rule standard. The rhetoric of the court would most probably be, since I am applying the business judgment rule, I will not intervene in the decision. The court most probably will not comment on the decision itself and will generally not say that it is not intervening despite the fact that the decision is bad or a stupid decision. Even though in the case of business judgment rule, there should be no intervention, even if the decision seems to the judge wrong or stupid. When implementing the business judgment rule, I find that I write the decision in two parts. In part one, I will explain why I should not intervene with the discretion of the board due to the business judgment rule. But then I will add a part two in which, to be on the safe side, I will check the decision on its merits to make sure it is a valid and a reasonable decision. This is what happened in one case I uh, dealt with, or math case, where th there was um, the plaintiff filed a motion for a derivative suit. 
since the company's board would not file such a suit against third parties, despite the plaintiff's opin opinion that they should do so. So after concluding in the first part of my decision that the board's decision was protected by the BJR, by the business judgment rule, since the claim was against third parties and not against the mem board members or against controlling shareholders, I went on and checked the board's decision on its merits and found it to be reason a reasonable one. And this is what I believe happens in many of the cases in which the courts in Israel decide to refrain from intervention. The decision would usually look like I described. In the first part of the decision, the judge will explain why the court should not intervene with the decision. And then above and beyond, the court will check the merits of the decision. So what I'm saying may have to do with the psychology of judges. I think most judges, at least most Israeli judges, will feel better if when looking into the decision itself, they would be satisfied that it seems a reasonable one. It is difficult for a judge to allow a company to act in a way that she thinks is wrong and harmful, even if we agree that it is not our role as judges to intervene in such decisions. But the implementation of the procedural rules is really put into test in those cases where the judge finds that the decision-making process was a due process. Then, if we want to be honest with ourselves, the question we have to ask ourselves is whether we would approve a decision or refrain from intervening if we suspect the decision does not make sense, or if we are sure it is a wrong decision. As I said, for a judge, it may not be an easy task to refrain from checking the merits of the relevant decision that is being attacked and improving it, disregarding its substance, only because the court should refrain from intervening in such cases, and since the decision-making process was a valid one. It is easier to do so if we are convinced that refraining from from intervention only means substituting judicial remedy for other remedies provided through markets or through private parties. <clears throat> uh, now I'd like to talk a little, about, a little about applying the procedural requirements. Courts would usually refrain from intervention in non-conflicted decisions, as I said, but as for decisions that involve a conflict of interest, Israeli courts are still shaping the scope and method, method of intervention. The fact that there is a legal procedure set in the leg legislature in these cases, as I said, approval by the majority of the, min the non-affiliated minority, did not stop co the court in Mahdeshima Gan, which I mentioned before, from intervening. However, as I mentioned, the court offered a procedure that, if applied, may immune the decision from intervention. So the court mentioned that the negotiations should be by an independent committee, with power to effectively vote against the deal, that will conduct actual real negotiations, that will not meet in the presence of the controlling shareholders, and that will have the opportunity to hire independent advisors. The Court of Chancery in the MFW case held that the business judgment standard of review should apply if, but only if, first, the controller conditions the transaction on approval of both a special committee and a majority of the minority stockholders, and the special committee is independent, the special committee is empowered to freely select its own advisors and to say no definitively, the special committee acts with care, the minority vote is informed, and there is no cohesion of the minority. The Court of Chancery found that these prerequisites were satisfied, and the court then reviewed the merger under the business judgment rule and granted summary judgment for the defendants. The question we're, that we're dealing with now is the question of applying these prerequisites, and more precisely, the question is what the court should do if when checking where these prerequisites were satisfied, its, its answer is not 100% positive. What should be the standard applied if, for example, there is an independent committee, and it is independent, not the three cousins. It is empowered to say no definitively, but it has no power to select it on its own advisors and it was advised by the company's lawyers or the company's accountants. That, does this by itself mean that the court should check the contents of the decision? In other words, if the procedure is not 100% as it should be, but only 90%, 80%, 70%, when should we go back to the entire fairness doctrine? When should the burden shift back to the defendants? And what if the controlling shareholder was present in some of the meetings, in all of them? Would that be enough to conclude that the court cannot rely on the procedure and has to check the merits of the decision? 
that the burden of proof shifted back to the majority to satisfy the court of the entire fairness of the deal. My forecast is that the center of attention of the courts will shift in the future from reviewing the substance of the decision to thoroughly reviewing the decision-making process. Such a review, in Israel at least, I think may require discovery proceedings uh, that would be aimed at revealing the process of the negotiations and not the terms of the deal itself. If, after thoroughly checking the process, the court is satisfied that the procedure was followed, checking the terms of the deal and its fairness is unnecessary. In other words, if we take the procedural review seriously, also in the case of conflicted decision, it may reduce the necessity to check the terms of the transaction and review them. This makes the process cheaper, since there is, not, there is no necessity to compare between the expert opinions, which is very problematic as we heard, and to cross-examine the experts, but only to make sure that the negotiation process followed the court's directions. A similar question may, may arise when applying the business judgment rule. When dealing with the business judgment rule, the court has to check in order to apply the rule that the board was fully informed and that there was no conflict of interest. But these questions are not always black and white as well. For example, what if the board was not 100% fully informed? If the board did not get 100% of, of the relevant information? And moreover, what if there was no direct conflict of interest between the majority and the minority? It is not a decision regarding the, con the, regarding the controlling shareholders' compensation. But the majority has different interests than the minority. Uh, again, the same question arises. Should we apply the business judgment rule despite the fact that the preconditions were not 100% met? So I only raised a few questions, some of which have already been dealt with in the past, and the others would probably be dealt with in the future. Thank you.